Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope all of you are having a fantastic day as we have a, well, fantastic show set up for you, where in the second part of the program, we will be doing computer and technology news with, uh, yeah, lots and lots of very interesting uh, tech stories and, you know, everything new and related, including something about, uh, you know, things like election security. We have some news on that. We have some news on uh, quantum entanglement. Hey, if that's up your alley and a lot more besides. So we're going to have a lot of that in the later part of the show, but in the first part of the program, we have a great interview set up for you where, you know, looking forward to this and, uh, Hey, it's, it's about again, kind of a personal passion just a couple of days ago. Let me triple check, make sure that we got the right name here. Just a couple of days ago, we interviewed a company called the Basel Action Network. They do a lot of great work with sustainability and things like that. And Hey, I guess we almost have a theme going where today's going to be about sustainability as well, but you know, kind of knowing where your seafood comes from. And I know you wouldn't think that technology plays any kind of role in this, but um, yeah, thankfully it's, uh, you know, technology is doing a lot of great things in a lot of different areas. So we are going to be talking to the chairman of Niceland Seafood in just a moment. But before we do, a couple of things, including ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything from a link to our guest website, any stories, articles, videos that we show here on the program. We will be, uh, yeah, we will be, of course, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I'm sorry, we will include it in the show notes. And while you're at our website, be sure to check out the social media contest brought to you by Logitech and the live videos uh, and the live video feed brought to you by OWC. All right, so a little a little distracted, but let's go ahead and get started. And uh, again, looking forward to this. So joining us is the one, the only, Mr. Oliver Luckett, and he is the chairman of Nice and Seafood, and he's here to tell us all about their mission, what they do, and uh, yeah, seafood sustainability. So Oliver, thank you for joining us here on Computer America. Yeah. Good shit, man. Yeah, our pleasure, our pleasure indeed. So why don't we go ahead and uh, before we get started on, you know, Niceland, your mission and all that kind of thing, you have a pretty varied past. I mean, anyone can go off and uh, Google your name. (laughs) And, you know, when it comes to things like uh, revenue sharing, uh, I'm sorry, uh, revenue sharing for, uh, you know, videos or managing celebrities or, you know, you teach at a bunch of different universities and the like, give us a bit of your background. Sure. Yeah, so you know, I started in the technology world in in '96 uh, when I graduated from college, and that was a really exciting time to be, you know, kind of in San Francisco at the epicenter of the dot com revolution, and and so I really focused kind of consistently on how technology would interrupt or you know kind of rewrite uh, the tools and the systems that we used, and so. My career really started in uh, disintermediating the telephone industry. I started in voice over the internet with a company called Quest Communications in Denver. And, you know, that didn't make better phone call quality necessarily, uh, but it made flat rate pricing in America. So we moved away and did tariff arbitrage and moved away from, you know, the per minute charges to flat rate pricing. And it really taught me a, a valuable lesson that, you know, because of all the regulations that exist and because of just precedent in the way networks were built, there was a lot of opportunity to, to disintermediate, you know, through, through new technologies and through new paradigms such as voice over the Internet. And so I moved on into video over the Internet as the, the pipes grew thicker. Uh, and, uh, and so from that, uh, I built out the first examples of how a person would monetize their content 
uh, using revenue sharing. So placing an ad either beginning or at the end of a video and then sharing that revenue and, and a big phenomena of cultural history, if you call that, of things like Diet Coke and Mentos, they emerged on the Rever platform that we had built. And we were the first people to pay creators uh, in that medium uh, for their content and for their virality and for their popularity. And so I uh, ended up in Hollywood and worked uh, my way up the, the chain from video into actually managing personas. Uh, it was a time, for instance, in 2007 and eight, when platforms like Facebook were becoming prevalent, but a celebrity didn't know if it was supposed to be their version of them in high school or whether it was their character or whether it was their you know, kind of PR and public persona. And so we created the last company that I did uh, was called The Audience. Uh, I was just coming off of, of having had a, a very fun and successful run at Disney where I became head of innovation there. And so I, I went and I started learning about how to tell both people's and brand stories inside of social media. And for about four and a half years, uh, this company called The Audience, we got to touch all different kinds of industries and celebrities, everything from the Obama campaign uh, that we worked on in 2012 to big projects like uh, Dove Beauty Sketches that kind of changed the paradigm of how women look at themselves uh, in, in social media and look at themselves uh, from a self-esteem standpoint. And so I got to really have a very interesting perspective on the world from all these different angles and, you know, from, from managing personas of, of big celebrities like a Charlize Theron or a Hugh Jackman or, you know, uh, or a Steve Aoki, mm -hmm. you know, one, some of these DJs that, that really made their careers in social media. And that brought me in 2011 to a small volcanic island in the North Atlantic uh, now everyone knows Iceland. It seems to be on everyone's bucket list. Uh, but I'm actually calling you now from Reykjavik, uh, where I live. Um, I, after selling the audience in 2015, uh, moved to Iceland. Uh, I was introduced to Iceland through Bjork and through her career and through a very special project called Biophilia, which was really the first application-based album uh, sold on iTunes. And it was a really ambitious project with York and David Attenborough and myself and how we we uh, you know really launched a new paradigm in music where we would build an education program for for kids that went through the Nordic countries and really spent a lot of time looking at kind of Scandinavia and its values and so when I sold the company in 2015 I left LA uh, and my husband and I moved to Iceland and we took a break. I wrote a book called The Social Organism, which is about at large scale, I think social systems start looking like biological systems. And, but I also just kind of questioned, it was during, you know, during the election and questioned, you know, what was all going on with kind of Western humanity, if you call it that. And, right. and, I, and I made you know, big decisions to, to move to a, a, you know, a, very, a very different place than Los Angeles, I would say. And so when I got here, I did the same practice that I used to do for celebrities, kind of finding their five core values. Uh, that's how we would program, you know, a celebrity's social media content as we would kind of build out this value system. And I basically turned the mirror on myself and said, look, you know, Oliver, why, why are you here in Iceland? What brought you here? What is it about this country or about this, you know, idea of a culture? And so I, I really looked at it, and it came down to five basic principles. Iceland, because of its harsh environment, is deeply connected to nature, right? You know, the, the weather predicts everything. Right now, there's a, a rolling holiday in Iceland called Bongo Blida, and that's what we're having right now because it's the fourth day of sunshine this year. <laughs> We've had really the worst summer in 100 years. And so everybody just leaves work and they're out at the pubs and they're outside and they're at the swimming pools. And so, you know, nature is, is, is inextricably linked to the kind of human experience here in Iceland. And the second thing is, is this idea of sustainability. You know, everybody uses that word in different ways. And, and our version of sustainability is not only is it good for the environment or good for nature or good for the animals that, that we cohabitate with, but that it's also good for communities and good for economies. And so 
in our mind, sustainability is systems like the fishing industry in Iceland that maintain some core set of of, of sustenance and, and value for communities, but also are capitalist, right? They are they are actually economically viable systems that can pay for themselves and propel forward without subsidy, but that they're also respectful of nature. And I'll get back to that in a minute, but then you look at the kind of third value of Iceland, which is humanism. At every point along the way in Iceland's history, decisions have been made for the good of the people. And and that is a really compelling thought because right now Iceland is always voted for the last 11 years as the most peaceful country in the world. There is no military. There's no money spent on military. Uh, they they believe in, in investing that within the people themselves. You've got great health care. You've got great child care. You've got a whole list of things that are social indices of what it means to be human and humanistic. And when I first came to Iceland uh, in 2011, there was a party, a political party that I got involved with called the Best Party. And it's a famous story about it after the collapse of the economy here, after the the 2008 um, uh, economic kind of meltdown mm-hmm. globally. It really all began in Iceland, and Iceland actually went bankrupt as a country. Uh, emerged out of that, this political leader named Jong Nar, who was a comedian, and his sidekick, this woman, Heather Kristen Helgadotter, who's now my business partner here. Uh, but they created the first political party in social media to win basically a national election. And I was, you know, very interested in deep inside of social systems and looking at phenomena. And so I got very interested in this political party. And it was funny at first, but then it won, right? It was a comedian who was, you know, kind of playing a joke on everyone. And then suddenly everyone took it seriously and they won in a landslide. And now they were having to redo the energy contracts and redo the city government and redo, you know, the the relationship that the banks had with the with the citizens. And so it became very serious very quickly. And they took a, a, an interesting approach to politics, which is called humanism, right? Where humans came first. My favorite quote from all of it was, we will participate in corruption openly, and therefore it will just be business. <laughs> and so they take this kind of comedic stance, but, but it's a really important kind of tentpole. And then there are other values like hyperconnectivity. You know, for your audience, most people probably don't know this, but Iceland has the highest bit rate per capita uh, of any Western country. South Korea is usually number one, but Iceland has single mode gigabit fiber to every home in Reykjavik. 88,000 homes are now serviced uh, by the energy company here with single mode fiber to the home. And the average bit rate on your telephone is around 200 megabits a second. It's, it's quite incredible to see now how 80% penetration of Snapchat, 96% penetration of Facebook. So social media is really a, a big tenant here and part of the culture. And then, of course, the last one is that Iceland uh, really loves arts and culture. Um, it has been always hitting over its weight in artists like Bjork or Sigur Ross or of Monsters and Men or of Kaleo. And so I'm a big art collector and, and, uh, and actually live in an old museum on the ocean. Uh, that I'm sitting in right now in Reykjavik. <clears throat> and so that combination of values led me to create a fund here uh, with investment partners where we would invest in companies that embody those values. And so Niceland Seafood was the first company that we uh, built out of this. And what's fascinating is, is that in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, Iceland went through and and the world, uh, especially the Nordic states, went through multiple collapses of fishing stock. There was the great herring collapse of 68. And then, and so they learned very quickly that if they were going to be a nation uh, that is, you know, very uh, dependent upon um, the ocean, then they needed to learn to respect it in new ways. And so they started building data systems early on uh, that are called the quota system here that basically looked at any geographical region around the island and had scientists go out and basically measure the fish stocks. And then they would set flexible quotas as to how much the fishermen could consume during that month or that year. 
And so out of that emerged these very smart uh, and, and highly advanced data systems that we leverage today. Uh, there's a, a governing body here called FISCA-STOFA, which actually sets the quota every year. And so this was just, this information was kind of sitting here uh, in public data systems. And so, you know, when a new fresh perspective like myself comes to town, you know, I start looking at these systems and I'm like, wow, why is, why is no one using this, right? Why is, I know it's being used to, to manage and maintain fishing stocks and fishing quotas, but this is a great consumer story, right? If someone can see the provenance of the fish that they're eating and if someone could see that it was, you know, managed in a responsible way and hear the person that caught it and hear the, the species and here's, you know, the community that this, that this supports and the livelihood of these processing plants and all these different components of the logistics chain. And so we started digging deeper and we started seeing like, wow, you know, all these tourists are starting to come to Iceland mainly because of Instagram. Mm -hmm. If you actually look at the growth of tourism from 2012 until present day today, uh, it's grown from about 400,000 people to over 3 million tourists uh, this year. You have you have so, no one to blame except the beautiful landscapes that you guys have because that's correct. really yeah exactly right. I mean that's really the it was Instagram it was it was influencers that came out here and took their blue lagoon selfie right it was influencers that came and took these amazing waterfalls and these landscapes and and, and by the way you know taking not I mean you cannot it's you know Iceland is gorgeous I mean I'm I'm planning a road trip this weekend out to the east. I've actually never been there. I've been here you know, 40 times and lived here for two and a half years. And there's still places to go and explore. And so this weekend, I'm really excited. I'm taking a nature trip out to the east for a, an arts festival uh, called Lunga. And so, you know, you're right. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, the nature is, is you can look at hashtag Iceland on Instagram and see 8 million images that people have created since the start of, of Instagram. You know, compare that with something like a Coachella Music Festival, which I used to work on the brand of, and that's around three and a half million well, hashtags and, and, on and, Instagram. So. And I think this is a good, you know, kind of jumping off point because obviously, you you know, the start of your career and the middle of your career was really embracing social media, uh, you know, and Honestly, we don't really get into politics here, but you did mention some, uh, you know, some happenings with politics sure. that that continue to pervade, um, especially you know, being Computer America, focusing on the U.S. Uh, I kind of have a question for you, and that concerns Iceland social media. What is it about social media that you feel Iceland or individuals that you work with kind of do right? that so many uh, countries, companies, people, individuals, that they yep. do wrong? What, what are some of the big pitfalls? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's authenticity, right? And so if you have the backdrop of nature and you have a humanistic society that isn't hiding anything or isn't trying to sell you anything, it's pretty factual. You know, it's pretty, pretty, pretty picture-based, nature-based, statistic-based. I mean, when you're dealing with, you know, a murder a year, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, then you're not really hiding a lot. And, and that's another very interesting facet of this is that, you know, here we're talking about an island that burns no hydrocarbons whatsoever for fuel. They figured out how to harness geothermal and hydroelectric energy in the late 70s. And, and so now, you know, you have this pristine nature. You've got this community driven society because everyone is related within eight generations. So it changes because it's so interconnected socially and because you have such pervasive use of connective technology, you're really living in a world that, that is advanced in a lot of respects. And so the, the connectivity here, I mean, look, the, the negative side of it is you start a rumor and four hours later, it is everywhere. You know? <laughs> so so there, there, are, there are the good and the bad around it. But social media is absolutely the tool in which someone launches a restaurant here, someone launches a tourism, someone launches a, a government or political idea or campaign. And you see it, you know, in my book, I talked a lot about how ideas reach a maturation point where they become kind of status quo or, or they become part of the, the kind of social organism, if you will. You see that very rapidly here, um, you know, whether it was gay rights that happened in the 60s or whether it was women's rights that's been a big conversation of course with the you know hashtag me too mm -hmm. you know 
Iceland was the first to have equal pay. Iceland was the first to have a lesbian female prime minister in the late 60s. You know, it's like it was always per, by per capita, of course, because there are only 350,000 inhabitants on this island. There have been fewer than one million Icelanders in world history. So you've got a small population that's hyper-connected that has leveraged social media, I think, in a very mature and, and open and transparent way. And so a lot of things that we you know, generate discussion in America actually lead to real change here. You know, they, they are part of the, the, the government and part of the system, and people do pay attention to the, the social media movements, and they do make change very quickly just because you have a much smaller, less complicated society than right. somewhere that has a thousand more people, you know, like America. But, but that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's part of what we're trying to, in the companies that we're doing, uh, especially with Niceland Seafood, which is coming to America and launching, you know, in, in, and has launched in Colorado, uh, where we think a lot of people there share values. But, you know, we'll be in hundreds of grocery stores by the end of the year uh, with this seafood experience is what we call it. And so the birth of this came also by the fact that you have a small population of people and the logistic systems and things that have happened in the sharing economy, you know, the idea of fleet management at a scale like Uber has, right, where you have an individual automobile that's being tracked as part of a larger system. You know, those are the ideas that we can now apply to a 10 kilogram box of fish that just came out of the ocean and is now delivered to a grocery store less than 24 hours later, halfway around the world, right? So. So what's happened is in sequence is Iceland has this very, you know, pure nature based imagery, reality, you know, sustainability. And then you have those values that people are seeking, you know, when they leave here, they come to Iceland, they have this kind of magical experience and then they leave and there's not much really to consume as part of that experience. You have Icelandic glacial water, which has been very successful, but of course people have all kinds of ideas of plastic bottles bringing, you know, glacier water halfway around the world. And then you had this product uh, called Siki Skier, which is a high protein, uh, low fat uh, milk based product, sort of like a yogurt uh, that was recently purchased by a yogurt company. I now, now I think it's mainly called Siggy's yogurt, mm -hmm. but that was kind of the staple of, of Icelandic uh, uh, dairy products here. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the strong man's energy drink, right? It's high okay. protein and low fat. And so, so we were saying, you know, we want to extend this experience and there's, there's nothing, you know, kind of more Icelandic than great fresh fish, whether it's cod or Arctic char or monkfish or wolffish or redfish or all these different species. And so as, as part of that, I said, well, how, how can we figure this out? And so we went and spoke with Iceland Air uh, which is the nation's, you know, kind of premier airline. And we said, you know, you're extending your routes now. Like Iceland Air flew to five cities in 2011. Now it flies to you know, 15 in America. And so now there are all of these direct flights because of the tourism boom. We, we heard that it's very analogous to what happened with Alaskan seafood with Alaska Airlines. As Alaska Airlines kind of built out its company and its, you know, hub and spoke architecture and or you know, and it's, it's flights and, and things like that. It was able to take things like Copper River salmon and move them through North America. So the same thing is happening with our transportation infrastructure. And then we have an upstart airline called Wow Airlines, which is now about the same size as Iceland Air. So you've got this awareness of Iceland. You have this tourism boom that's mainly millennial, you know, Instagram-based tourists. And now you've got the best and highest quality and purest and most natural fish in the world that is, you know, the oceans here have, have really been plastic free for the most part uh, where, you know, we just have the North Atlantic here is just a, a different environment than you see in the Pacific and, and other places that are really under a lot of pollution pressure and things like that. So we've got a, a very clean, pure ocean that's been protected ever since the Cod Wars. That's the only quote war that Iceland ever fought. In reality, it wasn't a war. It was just protecting up to 200 miles around the island. Right. That's now governed by Iceland and, and protected by our Coast Guard. So. And, and the fishermen themselves. Right. So, so, so we've got all these. 
factors that came together, you know, it's kind of everything that rises converges. And so now we have the ability to build out using fleet management software and other tools to build out a literal end-to-end narrative of from the moment the fish is caught, it's registered with the government, it's put on a boat, it's the temperature, we measure everything from the temperature at which the water it was caught in to the temperature that it's throughout the entire life cycle, for instance. Uh, We leverage other people's technology that have radio transmitters in the shipments. I mean, we're really trying to build a world-class logistics system here that is independent of the carrier, right? Independent of whether it's on a plane or a truck or you know, or a boat uh, that's independent of the transport mechanism, but we're really kind of building this layer three network. If you look at it from an OSI standpoint, this layer three network of intelligence where we're saying, okay, here's the temperature, here's the species, here's where it is anyway in the life cycle of getting it to the consumer. And then we've, we've basically leveraged the fact that, and I don't know if, if everyone knows this, but I think your listeners should, is that every iPhone device now uh, about 86% of them that have upgraded to uh, iOS 11 have QR code reading built into the camera. Right. So you just open the camera, and point it at a QR code, and down pops a, you know, a Safari window or whatever application it's activating. And so we've been able to build a very simple technology that, that is QR code based, where the consumer simply points the camera at the QR code at the seafood counter, at the product, at the restaurant menu, and it then tells you instantly the life of that fish and how it got to you and the provenance and then the transport. And, and all the granular detail is available in the back end of the temperature it was kept at all the way through the transport chain and logistics chain. And so it also is improving the customer service for the vendor, right? So back you know, a year ago, if you ordered you know, 20 kilograms of fish, it was still a phone-based business for the most part. I mean, we went and sat with fish brokers in Iceland and we sat with customs brokers in America and, and we're just trying to really build a supply chain here that is modern because a lot of people in all these various transport industries you know, don't necessarily use the latest technology. It's a big expense or they just don't have the investment to do so or the will to do so. And so we've come in with totally fresh eyes and said, how do we build this very complicated system and abstract it to the level where the consumer can now with confidence, you know, show their family, like, here's the fish you're eating and here's a little bit about sustainability and here's the captain of the boat and here's an interview with him. And it really is humanizing this experience. It, it really is. And I, you know, obviously we can ask you lots of questions. We have like two minutes left, so uh, I won't keep it for much longer, but I want to ask you one question and it's very simple. It's why? And to be more specific, it's why, <laughs> why do you have to humanize the fish that people kind of eat? Because obviously uh, you can go out, you can buy a filet of fish. You don't know where it comes from. Yep. They can say it's yep. from one place. Why is not just uh, yep. knowing where it comes from, but verifying where it comes from. Why is that so important to you? Yep. So when I was eight years old, my dad took me to Epcot. And, you know, Walt Disney had this dream and this vision of this kind of experimental prototype community of tomorrow. And when I was 16, I got to win the International Science Award uh, at Epcot. And then when I was 35, I gave kind of a tearful speech about how my whole dream was to carry on that kind of legacy. And when I was at Epcot, I learned about hydroponics and aquaponics and about what the future could be like from sustainability. And having done social media now, for all of these people around the world. I've felt a sense of having to share values by creating products that actually teach someone something uh, that they didn't know, right? And that was unexpected. And so that is the reason that I'm focused on things like nice and seafood. You know, I, I, I'm a technology entrepreneur, uh, you know, sex, <laughs> Seafood is not necessarily the sexiest business in the world. Mm-hmm. It's not a, an, you know, an automatic next step for me as an entrepreneur. But what it allows me to do is fulfill this kind of dream I have that by leading by example and by living by example, that you can actually share with someone a connection with the earth that they're living and, in and uh, with the and, environment and with and Oliver, I'm gonna have reliable right there. and sustainable uh, uh, processes. Yeah, I'm gonna have to right there. We're just flat out of time. Oliver, if people wanna find out more, where can they go? 
you can go to NicelandSeafood.com. All right, perfect. And everyone, uh, hey, we'll be right back. More Computer America. Oliver, thank you so much. Greece is cheap, but the airfare costs so much. a fortune. Paris? Bye-bye. Not much closer. And again, airfare. Bye. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? low-cost airlines with one call to low-cost airlines you'll drastically slash your travel costs we're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations where would you like to go london rome costa rica australia wow that's cheap so why wait call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the u.s or international our prices are so low we can't publish them the only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 oh, minutes past the hour. And I know our interview was cut short there rather abruptly. So we just want to make sure that everyone had all the material that they needed if they wanted to go check out more. Again, uh, we talked to Niceland Seafood. That's like Iceland, but with an N. So Niceland. And yeah, we talked to uh, to Mr. Oliver Tuckett. And, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Oliver Luckett, I believe. There we go. And yeah, Oliver Luckett, he is the chairman of the company. And yeah, it seems like they're doing a lot of different initiatives to really bring, uh, as he said so often, a humanity-focused uh, company mission and really standards. So that was very interesting. More in the show notes if you want to check it out. And again, NicelandSeafood.com. So with, uh, and also, I, I, I guess I should say, he should probably write a book. Oh, wait, he did. So the human organism, if you didn't catch that, uh, he, you know, he's a, he's a very smart guy. And it was a pleasure having him on. And of course, a pleasure to talk about uh, his mission there. So in the meantime, though, we are going to do computer and technology news. And this is a segment brought to you by OWC, where we cover all of the latest and greatest computer and technology news that there is. So here we go, Computer Technology News, OWC. So with, uh, here we go, let's go ahead and get started. So I think the first story that we're going to cover, let's go ahead and talk about this one. This happened, I want to say a couple of days ago, but it was a pretty big, uh, it was a pretty big shift and a really something that I think is going to come to, I don't want to say ahead, but it's going to come, uh, become very relevant. The more 3D printers invade our everyday lives. And so far, they did not take off like we assumed here, even on the program. We interviewed a lot of companies, you know, from MakerBot to a number of others that were determined to get a 3D printer into your home, into your garage, and really be kind of that next uh, printer, printer, or computer. 3D printers were going to be the next big thing. Well, I think adoption rate has been a little bit slower, uh, although in certain fields, they are you know, kind of a, a mainstay. And even in places such as public libraries, they are often available for use. Hey, 
you know, if uh, if you want access to one, odds are there is a private company or a library somewhere uh, that will give you access to theirs or even ones that uh, operate strictly online where you simply send them what you want to print and they will print it and ship it to you, uh, you know, very, very affordably. So here's the point is that, well, it may just get a little bit stickier where this coming from Ars Technica, uh, Cirrus Farivar talking about 3D printed gun lawsuit ends after three years in the courts. And I remember when, you know, someone showed off the first 3D printed gun, it was almost a single fire and then someone made a six round shooter. Um, you know, someone even after that was able to make, I think like one with a, re a reloadable magazine. All of them were shot behind safety glass because, well, they had a tendency to explode because plastic under that much sudden explosive force tended to explode. But through refinement and uh, engineering and good old human know-how, uh, 3D printed guns have become a real uh, topic of conversation. And uh, again, more 3D printed handguns. We're not talking about rifles or anything like that. But it's still important to note because these are handguns, you know, you know real guns that can be used in really un untraceable ways because you don't have to go through any kind of the manufacturing uh, regulations that you have where you have to stamp it, you have to know who you sold it to, you have to know who, uh, you know, how'd you get your hands on this thing. No 3D printed guns, they're you know, they're kind of here to stay apparently. So let's talk about this article talking about the 3D printed gun activist group, which is defense distributed, has secured a settlement with the Department of State that will enable it to legally distribute its CAD files for firearms on its DEF CAD website, putting an end to years long lawsuits. So you can obviously see where the Department of State or other government agencies would want to regulate, restrict the amount of access people have to manufacture their own guns. And of course, it wasn't going to work. The, you know, I'm surprised that, that the lawsuit ended the way it did. Uh, but that's the thing about computer files is that once one of them is out there, you can copy the file indefinitely. And you can't say that, uh, hey, just stop this file from being sent. No, because someone else can go back and even recreate it from scratch. A CAD file is not anything really unique. So they were trying to restrict the ability for people to actually download a file onto their computers, much in the way someone would say, hey, you're not allowed to download that MP3. And odds are that MP3 file is going to be everywhere because you're trying to restrict it. So this, uh, let's see, a statement uh, uh, to Ars Technica here in the article saying it's just now black letter law that you, that you can traffic in this information, saying that, uh, noting that, sustain, that substantially not much will change given that the files have been available on torrent sites for years. And that's another point, uh, you know, that I was trying to make in a roundabout way was that saying that the file is not available torrent sites, which are often hosted overseas on foreign servers, on places that the U.S. just doesn't have jurisdiction to. And again, the reproducibility, the fact that you just hit control C, control V, and suddenly, oh my God, there's two files now. This is getting out of hand. And yeah, you know, that's something that happens all the time. And even while this lawsuit was going, working its way through the courts, uh, the files themselves have been re-uploaded, re-hosted thousands and thousands of times. And if you really want to get your hands on this, it was going to be possible. So this is simply taking it out of the shadows, out of something that I think a lot of people could probably find a way. And as I said, you know, there isn't the need for the subterranean dark web saying it can be done in the clear net and in the light of day in reputable places. So yeah, I guess that's their major victory. It's they're taking it off of illegal places that you could download this from and again which were quick easily accessible and free and now i guess they're trying to do it in the light of day and let's face it 
they're probably going to try to monetize what it is that they're doing there. So the settlement, which was signed in April but only took effect in late June, says that DEFCAD files in question are approved for public release and in any form and are exempt from exporting license, licensing requirements of the International Traffic in Arms Regulation. So not even the, uh, not even the firearm uh, regulators have any kind of say over what happens to not just the files, but the products made from the files. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, let's go ahead and skip down here a little bit. Uh, let's see, it, uh, Robert Clifton Burns, an export lawyer who is not affiliated in this case, told ours that a, that a change of the relevant laws was inevitable and that within months, experts expect that any American will be able to publish such files as they see fit, saying that that putting something on the internet is an export to the entire world is ridiculous. And yeah, I mean, heck, you can see where he's coming from saying that, hey, I'm putting this up on my website and saying that that is, a, is an international export. That makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, this case was so mired in implication. That's why it took three years for them to say that, hey, a file cannot be restricted. Um, this is so mired in implication because the United States, uh, we're very liberal about our gun laws. The Second Amendment has a lot of sway here, and it's very hard to get any kind of legislation on the books about firearms, even Second Amendment, or I'm sorry, even 3D printed ones. Uh, but whatever happens on the United States internet kind of happens on the world internet. And that means that these plans, not just in the United States, not just on the dark web, but are now available to anyone and everyone, especially places such as Australia, the UK, uh, many other places that have much stricter gun laws, but not as strict uh, 3D printing laws. Because, hey, why would you? The implications are, of course, that places that do not sell traffic or people do not have ready access to firearms, well, suddenly, overnight, they now have access to a CAD file that lets them print a firearm. Pretty interesting, and hopefully no one ever gets hurt by this, but as, as the lawyer said, the legislation behind it, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that you can't restrict this kind of information from getting out there. So meanwhile, meanwhile, lawmakers are continuing to try to battle Wilson and his ilk in different ways, saying on June 12th, the New Jersey Attorney General sent a letter to ghost, run manufacture, ghost gun manufacturers, I'm assuming these are guns with no traceable origin, ordering them to stop selling and advertising unregistered and unserialized assault weapons to New Jersey residents. At this point, it's a public... Oh, what, how do you call this? It's a public information game where you can go one of two ways. You can either hopefully, you know, you can think, well, I hope no one knows that you can print your own gun. Or you can go the other way saying 3D printed guns are now a thing. Uh, here's why you shouldn't use them. Here's why you should buy them from, re from reputable vendors if you are going to purchase them. And why you shouldn't trust every random CAD file. Uh, obviously. You know, if I'm going to, uh, you know, kind of put myself out there when it comes to 3D printed guns, there are probably going to be a lot of people making iterations on these CAD files, uh, altering a CAD file or, or a computer aided design file is nothing hard. There's free software out there. You can design these things in your, you know, uh, you know, in your basement. It's not hard. Um, if you download one, be careful because not all of them are up to spec. And as we've seen before, plastic is plastic and they can and will explode in your hand. So be careful what you get. It's, um, yeah, it's about to be a dangerous world for 3d printed guns. Now that again, to cat, to, uh, you know, to kind of overview this, it is now legal to distribute the CAD files for 3d printed firearms. So we'll see what comes of this. It's a, uh, it's pretty interesting development. 
So there's that one. And again, for anyone just joining us, we are doing computer and technology news where we focus on anything and everything having to do with, uh, with technology. And speaking of technology, you may heard, and I heard some of the most hy hyperbolic language being used about Amazon Prime Day. You know, I'm starting to get... Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I'm starting to get really frustrated with Amazon Prime Day. Prime Day is, you know, one of those things that it... If nothing else, it shows you how much a company can accomplish with enough advertising dollars. They are marketing the heck out of the fact that they are willing to sell you products that are already available at a slightly lower price and odds are probably not even at a lower price than it would be at other times of the year. It's Amazon showing that they can make a quote unquote pseudo national holiday because they are one of the biggest companies out there. And well, we have, uh, and yeah, uh, it's one of those things that they're really showing off what they can do and something that we used to do with, uh, you know, with Apple back in the day and, um, uh, and Microsoft and Bill Gates back in the day, we like to talk about people's wealth and Amazon and what they've done with Jeff, Jeff Bezos. And well, he just crossed another milestone saying that Amazon founder Jeff uh, Bezos is now the richest person in recent history. Check that out. He has done it again. Man, it's good to be rich. Good, good to be such a controlling owner of Amazon. Like, for everyone out there who thinks about their stock tendencies and think, man, if only I had invested $10,000 into Amazon stock back in 2003 or something. Uh, yeah, you're looking at what happens when someone invested everything into Amazon back in 2003. And it led to Jeff Bezos, again, being the richest person in recent history. Uh, so... Let's say uh, Jeff Bezos it has been one of the world's wealthiest people for a while, but he's now set a new record saying he's the wealthiest person in recent history, saying that the Amazon founder's net worth has topped $151 billion with a B, $151 billion, making him not only the world's richest person, which, uh, you know, formerly was Bill Gates at $95 billion. What a chump $95 billion is. But saying that he's the richest person in modern times, which, if you adjust for inflation, even Bill Gates back in 1999, some would say the heyday of Microsoft. Yeah. If you adjust for inflation, Bill Gates was worth a paltry $149 billion in today's money. So he accomplished the feat largely through Amazon's success. And as you might guess, there was uncanny timing as he reached the milestone right on some glitchy prime day. So yeah, let's uh, saying that uh, the chief executive is also known for his myriad of invest of investing in a myriad of businesses. I mean, heck, even ourselves, we are streaming on twitch.tv and twitch.tv was purchased, I want to say about two years ago by Amazon. I mean, they are very good at, you know, finding startups and just snapping them up. Uh, most recently, I think a lot of this uh, recent stock drive was to the fact that Amazon is considering getting into the, uh, getting into the, the prescription medication business and, you know, everyone freaked because everything Amazon touches, it's a big deal. So they said that the achievement isn't exactly cause for celebration under some of those under uh, Bezos's wing, including warehouse workers across Europe are on strike over both low pay and poor working conditions. And those concerns are far from new. In fact, we've actually, uh, We've actually, you know, kind of reported on this for a while now that Amazon warehouse working conditions are so poor that, you know, to meet the quote unquote quotas, 
they, you know, because I don't think it's like a strict quota. You just have to, uh, you know, you have to do this uh, so much productivity, not a specific number, but at any rate that people are incentivized to do very unhygienic and uh, just in general, uh, you know, not very worker friendly kind of things. So saying that if Bezos can afford to privately fund Blue Origin Space Tourism, they argue, why is it a stretch for him to pay for better wages and working conditions among his warehouse staff? So this isn't to say that Bezos hasn't been willing to give people in need. He has contributed to uh, philanthropic causes in the past and last year was even asking for yeah, and so uh, even asking for suggestions on Twitter as to what he should philanthropically mind himself with. So Gates is a distant second to Bezos at the moment, in part because of his large ongoing donations to charitable pursuits, and there could easily be calls for, for Bezos to do the same. So again, the main thrust of this article, 151 billion dollars in today's money puts him slightly above 149 billion dollars in adjusted for inflation money of bill gates back in 1991 and makes him one of the richest people in modern history and i'm sure coming up on some of the richest people ever i'm sure that uh you know there's some uh indian tea companies or whatever you want to call it the the tea the tea shipping companies and the you know and the uh, and the Van and the Vanderbilts and people like that, but at the same time, wildly, wildly uh, successful. So, yeah, if you thought Amazon was going anywhere, odds are, eh, it's going to be around for quite a while. So keep an eye on that. And again, just just kind of fun to learn about uh, where people are and how and how they're doing. So good to hear that he's doing well. So let's go ahead and uh, move on to some of these other stories. I had one from yesterday. I don't think I have it anymore. It was about a $2 million electric racing car. And that was, uh, you know, super, super interesting. All right. How about this one? So Internet of Things, the idea that not just your computer, not just your phone, not just your tablet, not just your anything and everything, but now literally your everything is connected to the Internet. How about an Alexa-controlled microwave? You heard that right. That is a microwave connected to the internet, and not just the internet, but controlled by a digital assistant. Folks, we have reached peak laziness, and I love every second of it. So this is by General Electric. Their Alexa microwave cooks when you scan a barcode. So this obviously works with a smartphone app, uh, as most of these smart devices do. And check this out. So if you can kind of think, you know, I'm sure a lot of people here have used a microwave. It doesn't get much more complicated than throw something in, hopefully something that is microwavable, and hit, you know, two minutes and you walk away, come back two minutes later, later and you have food. Well, think about a day when instead of that simple process, you can do something else. And this is a, the brand has unveiled the smart countertop microwave with scan to cook features. And yeah, saying that uh, it's, you know, again, countertop microwave with scan to cook, which touts both Alexa voice control compatibility and its namesake scanning feature to speed up your culinary duties. So, and although, I mean, speed up your, your culinary duties, the microwave already speeds it up. So whatever, saying that the Alexa support is fairly self-explanatory, saying that you can use an Alexa device to add time or stop cooking, but scan to cook could be particularly helpful if you hate interpreting instructions on food boxes. Folks, do you hate reading? Well, this could be the app for you. Saying that, uh, yeah, you just, have, uh, you just have to scan a barcode on the packaging with a mobile app and it will choose the appropriate time and power levels. In other words, you shouldn't risk ruining your macaroni the first time you nuke it. Folks, if you are ruining your macaroni, um, yeah, maybe microwaving and maybe cooking in general just ain't for you. So, 
So yeah, let's uh, saying that there are more than three thousand meal items in the in the wow microwaves database to uh, to start. But GE Appliances is promising to expand the catalog. I'm sure others will be able to add to it. Um, one one second, folks. So yeah, saying that uh, obviously other people will probably be be able to add to it as time goes on. So beyond that, the main allure is the price. Well, this isn't the lowest cost microwave you'll find at $140. It's arguably smarter than machines costing considerably more. So you might rarely need to touch the buttons on the microwave itself to set the cook times. And yeah, you know, looks like they're running a limited time deal with some Echo Dot, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I guess the point of this is that if you thought microwaves were simple, just you wait a couple of years and yeah, you're gonna have to have a smartphone to operate a microwave at this rate. It's, uh, it's pretty ridiculous. So, all right, there's that one, pretty simple. Time for just one more quick one. Not a lot of time to get to this. We should mention this. Uh, Motherboard did a great piece on this. Can't get into, you know, Motherboard always dives really, really far into the sources and what they do and, you know, that kind of thing. But we should definitely bring this up. And the fact that voting machines, uh, we've talked about them here on the program. We've even had companies on the program who it was their job to secure and verify that voting machines are, well, accurate. And, uh, and yeah, so... Top voting machine vendor admits it installed remote access software on systems sold to states. The biggest problem here is that many people believe that voting machines should be air gapped. And the definition of air gapped is that nothing, no wireless signals are sent to and from any other device. Because just like in security, if you install a backdoor for any reason, and that could be something as inane as checking for statuses to checking to make sure that everything is, le is legit, the minute you add a backdoor to something that should be air-gapped is the minute that you alert everyone that, hey, this hardware is now susceptible to hacking, to monitoring, to everything else that comes with being connected to the internet. And this was something that wasn't supposed to happen, but again, top voting machine vendor admits that it had installed remote access software. So if you were hoping that there was even a shred of dignity when it comes to these electronic voting systems, and trust me, I love technology. I love it when it's able to be uh, utilized in you know, really clear and effective ways. But when you start adding these back doors and the ability to not just monitor what's going on, but even change the data that they receive, well, that's when you start to get a lot of very valid concerns about was this remotely changed? Because they can audit the machine, they can make everything on the machine look like that, yeah, 51% of people voted for this person, when in reality, they received zero votes whatsoever. You can change the outcome of an election, and yeah, it's um, one of those things that, you know, you'd really like for them to not compromise their own systems, but at the same time, they said that, uh, the voting machines that were sold over a six-year period between 2000 and 2006, they were indeed, well, no other way to put it. They were compromised. So again, we have a link to it in the show notes. You can check it out there, computeramerica.com. Uh, definitely look at this because it's, uh, you know, we're going to hear a lot more about this. But in the meantime, the music means that we are just about done. So yeah, and uh so yeah, let's go ahead and just say goodbye, everyone. I want to say thank you so much to uh, to Nice and Seafood for uh, coming on the program. It was a lot of fun talking to to Mr. Oliver about everything that he's he's doing. And honestly, he should probably work for the Iceland uh, tourism board because he made a very compelling case for not just visiting Iceland 
but moving to Iceland. So folks, in the meantime, thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to catch us tomorrow as we have on Darius Derek Shani. He is our computer graphics expert and hey, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So until next time, everyone, have a great day. Thank you so, so much. And hey, be sure to check out our podcast. Everyone, bye-bye.